Join me in Hebrews. We're going to pick up where we left off last week. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 15 is where we left off talking about the root of bitterness and how it can uh, defile people and and it, it causes trouble in people's lives. And so Hebrews 12, 15 says, look after each other so none of you fails to receive the grace of God. We discussed that. And then it says, watch out. So it's the same idea. Look out for each other. Watch out for one another. Help each other in this. That no poisonous root of bitterness grows up to trouble you, corrupting or defiling many. Last week I showed you this picture of a tree stump, of this aspen tree that we cut down in our backyard. And this, is, this has been just a crazy experience for me. Uh, since I cut this aspen tree down, uh, this is something that I wasn't expecting to happen, but there are little aspen trees shooting up all over the place. It's amazing. Uh, it's like this, this tree is, is trying to say, you know what, you thought, you thought you could cut me down and get rid of me? I will not die. I will multiply. You thought one aspen tree was bad. How about 50 aspen trees in your yard? How do you like that? That's what it feels like this tree is doing. It's incredible. And I have to address the roots. And we do have a plan. Uh, We we got some things that we're going to address these roots with. But I need a root killer. That's what I need. This this is going to continue to happen. These these shoots of this aspen tree are going to continue to pop up all over the place until... I kill the roots that's going to continue to cause problems for me. We need a root killer. And the same thing is true with our unresolved anger that turns into bitterness. When we are offended, when we are hurt or wounded, and we don't deal with that anger and get rid of it, it turns into these roots of bitterness. And those roots of bitterness cause us problems. They cause problems in our attitudes. They can cause problems in our relationships with other people. And certainly, if, uh, if there's things that pop up, like out of nowhere, like where uh, you say something, where did that come from? Or you respond in a way that does not look like Jesus, and you're like, I don't even know where that came from. Sometimes it can even damage our testimony as a follower of Jesus. So we need to deal with it. And last week, we talked about the first root killer, which is allowing God, trusting God to handle injustice, trusting God to handle injustice. And just as a reminder, it doesn't mean that we ignore sin. That doesn't mean that we stay silent when we should speak out against injustice or uh, stay silent when we should proclaim truth. It means that, yes, we speak truth in love. It means that we need to be right in the right way. But sometimes in life, you can do those things. And, and, in, and an injustice will still happen. We can be right in the right way. We can seek justice. We can speak out against injustice. We can, we can do all of those things. And sometimes an injustice happens and no one goes to jail. Sometimes an, an injustice happens and no one gets in trouble for it. No one gets held accountable. No one gets fired. Sometimes the truth gets suppressed, and lies get repeated, and people are deceived. And in those moments, we see all of this happening, and we're like, that's not right. You're right, it's not right. And we sometimes are tempted to push back in anger instead of lead in love. So as we speak truth, as we are committed to living what is right. We have to learn to lead in love. We have to then trust God to handle injustices. When it looks like those who are wrong are getting away with it, we say, you know what? God's going to have to deal with it. We're going to have to trust God to handle it, and He will. May not be in the timing that we want, like we like immediate stuff, like someone wronged us and we want God to blow that person up within like 30 seconds. Well, God doesn't always work on those timetables, right? We have to just trust God to deal with it, trust God to handle it. 
So that's root killer number one. Here's root killer number two. I alluded to it last week. It's forgiveness. It's forgiveness. Forgiveness is a root killer. So I, and it's probably not shocking to you, but I feel like I need to get all the buts and the whatabouts out of the way right up front. Because when people hear the word forgiveness, here's what typically happens. You hear the word forgiveness, and you might even read something in, in the Word of God about forgiveness, and then like there's something in the back of our minds that says this, but what about? But what about? And then you fill in the blank with something that we are trying to rationalize why we don't have to forgive. But what about? Am I just supposed to pretend this didn't happen? If I could just be blunt with you for a moment, honestly, most of the things that we are offended by, most of the things that irritate us, most of the things that, that frustrate us, yeah, you should just overlook it. Put it in a bubble and blow it away. Most of the things that get under our skin are just that. They are rooted in pride. They are rooted in selfishness. You didn't do what I wanted. You didn't do it when I wanted you to do it. You didn't do it the way that I liked it to be done. I am offended. Okay, let it go. Most of the things in life that tick us off are just that. Proverbs 19.11 says this, and I love that the reference, this is not a scriptural thing, this just helps me remember the reference. 19.11 is my favorite gun, right? <laughs> Proverbs 19.11 reminds me to respond to anger differently than that. Proverbs 19.11, a man's wisdom gives him patience. It is to his glory to overlook an offense. Mm. Most of the stuff that irritates us, offends us, frustrates us, if we're being honest, it's probably rooted in our own pride or selfishness, and we just need to overlook it. But in life, there are times when we experience a major wrong, when we are truly hurt or wounded, a law is broken, or a promise to be loyal, a promise to be faithful is broken. We are called to be right in the right way. And what that means for us is we need to let go of the anger and seek reconciliation when there is a genuine hurt and harm is done and we are, and we are, we are wronged. Matthew 18 talks about this. I'm going to ask you, we're done in Hebrews for now. If you go to Matthew 18, Jesus addresses this. And again, a lot of the stuff that we've talked about has been hard to hear. I admit it. It's hard for me to hear too, but I, but I believe as a follower of Jesus that we are, to, we are to surrender ourselves under the authority of God's Word. And so even if it's hard to hear, this is the standard, not, not me, not you. So Proverbs, or, sorry, Matthew 18, verse 15, Jesus says this. He gives this instruction. If another believer sins against you. Now, you might have a footnote there. Some of the manuscripts that they translate, the original manuscripts, they don't have any actual originals. So there are copies of the originals that survived. And, and some of the older manuscripts that we use to translate into English don't have the phrase against you. It just says, if another believer sins. And so there's question over whether or not this is uh, just just talking about if, if you personally are sinned against, or if in the community of believers someone is, is, is sinning, they're, they're living in, in some kind of sin, or, or they've done something wrong and they're not repenting of it, and they're just kind of uh, doing their own thing and, and making a mess of, of things in their life or in their family or whatever. Uh, I, I tend to believe, with taking the entire context of what Jesus says, that it's more that, that it's, if there's if there's someone that we love, someone that we care about, and they've sinned, and, and they don't want to own it, they don't want to repent of it, they just want to kind of live in it, we should love them enough to say something. But look how Jesus instructs us to do it. Either way, if another believer sins, whether it's against you or, or not, go privately. 
go privately and point out the offense. If the other person listens and confesses it, you've won that person back. But if you are unsuccessful, take one or two others with you and go back again. That was the standard in the Mosaic law uh, when someone was in the wrong. You needed to have at least two, better to have three witnesses. If I accuse you of kicking my cow and that you owe me something because you kicked my cow, there needed to be not just me saying that, someone else, there needed to be a witness. There was a standard there. And, and so Jesus is reaffirming that idea. Take some people with you, make this a little more official, and see if you can win this believer back uh, into right relationship with God through repentance. Verse 17, if the person still refuses to listen, take your case to the church. Wow, now, now this is pretty intense, right? If you can imagine uh, that being played out, that would be tough. That would be a hard thing. Then if he or she won't accept the church's decision, can you imagine that? Can you imagine being that dug in? Like you, you, you have uh, those who are, who are spiritually minded, who genuinely love you and care about you enough to say, look, this needs to change. You're, you're, you're in the wrong here. No, nah, I'm fine. You guys are all wrong. Like a hundred other people are wrong. I'm the only one that's right. Can you imagine? Uh, but that happens sometimes. Then if he or she won't accept the church's decision, treat that person as a pagan or a corrupt tax collector. Now, just pause on this for a moment. If someone doesn't know Jesus, right, they're far from God, and they don't know Jesus, and, and they go through life uh, living in a way that, that you would that makes sense. Clearly, they, they don't care what God thinks. What is, what is our heart attitude supposed to be towards that person? Is it hatred? It's not hatred, right? We're supposed to love that person. We're supposed to love that person and, and uh, treat them with kindness and respect and pray for them that they would uh, come to know Jesus as their Savior uh, and, and so the same thing is true if we're going to treat this person like a pagan or corrupt tax collector. We don't hate this person. Uh, we're not treating this person, you know, with disdain. Uh, but we're going we're gonna to pray that this person comes to repentance in Christ. So Jesus gives us this instruction about how to deal with sin, specifically in the community of the gathering of, of Jesus' followers that we call the church. It's important to understand that that relationship that's described there is the church family. It's also important to understand that Jesus just got done, before he gave that instruction, he just got done telling a parable. And the parable that Jesus told in verses 12 to 14 is the parable of the lost sheep and the, and the picture of that story is you have the shepherd who's got a hundred sheep and one of them goes off and does their own thing off doing some things that that sheep shouldn't be doing in places that sheep doesn't belong and what does the good shepherd who loves all of his sheep do well according to jesus that shepherd leaves the 99 in the safety of the flock and goes and pursues that one who's off where they shouldn't be doing things they shouldn't be doing out of love to bring them back into the safety and the protection of the flock, and is on the other side of that story that then Jesus talks about how we deal with sin within the context of the church. So overall, Jesus is saying, take sin seriously. There's a right way to be right. Don't just, uh, don't, don't just stomp people whenever they're in the wrong. Don't kick them when they're in the wrong. There's a loving and a proper way to deal with it. You deal with it, but do it in the right way. And then Peter asked this question. So just imagine, you're standing there, you're listening to all of this from the, the story of the, the shepherd and the hundred sheep and, and how to deal with sin. And then Peter says, or he asked this question in verse 21. Peter then came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how often should I forgive someone who sins against me? Next question, seven times? Peter is wondering, what is the limit on forgiveness? What is the limit on forgiveness? Forgiveness is a bitter 
root killer, but there's got to be a limit on it, right? What's the limit on forgiveness? Now, according to most Jewish rabbis of the time, three, that's the limit. Three forgives, that's all you get. You get three forgives. And then you don't have to forgive anymore. You get three. Peter's like, I know, imagine in his mind, right? I know that most rabbis say three forgives is all, but I think Jesus wants to be, us to be more gracious than that, so I'm going to more than double it. I'm going to give seven forgives. He thought, he thought he was being extravagant in his grace. But look at verse 22. So Jesus responds, no, nope, not seven. Now just pause on that. Imagine, I don't know how Jesus, like what the cadence of his response was. It doesn't tell us that. But imagine if it was like this. Peter says, how many times do I have to forgive? Seven times. And, and Jesus, maybe he responded, nope, not seven times. And just paused. He just left it hang for a second. Imagine what Peter might have thought in that moment in a pause. Oh, I guess three forgives is enough. I went way too far, and doubling it was seven. Uh, I, three must be enough. But after the pause, no, not seven times, Jesus says 70 times seven. Some, for, uh, some are translated 70 times 70. I'm not super great at math, uh, but that's a lot of forgives. That's a lot of forgives. Someone's doing the math. That's uh, fine. The, the, point, the point that Jesus is, is making, the answer to his question, is no limit. There's no limit. Think about this. Uh, someone, someone is good at math, and so maybe Peter was able to do the math good too, right? And just imagine, let's say it's 490. Like, let's say it's the 70, or 7 times 70. If it's 490, imagine Peter thinking to himself, how in the world am I going to keep track of all of these forgives for all of these people. I'm going to have to get a journal. Like if you sinned against me, you know, 18 times, I got to keep track of that. And this person over here, they sinned against me 37 times. I got to keep, how am I going to keep track of all of these times that I've forgiven all of these people in my life? I'm going to have to keep track of it in my little forgive journal, my little offense journal. And, and Jesus, uh, the, the point is, yeah, you're, you're not going to keep track of that. In fact, you're not supposed to. Paul writes it this way in 1 Corinthians 13. What does love do? Love keeps no record of what? Yeah. Love doesn't have the wrongs journal. Love doesn't have the offense journal. The I already forgave you 437 times journal. Why? Think of it like this. If we put a limit on forgiveness, what is going to happen to our anger after offense number eight? So let's say Peter's is the correct number. Let's say what it was. So offense number eight, now what do we do with our anger? Let's say that this other number is literal in the sense that, okay, you get 490 forgives. That's all you get. What happens on offense number 491? What do we do with our anger? Well, if we're supposed to hold on to our anger at 491, I guess that anger turns to bitterness. And that bitterness takes roots in, in our heart, and it poisons our attitude. It destroys our relationship. Do you see why Jesus is saying, no, you're thinking of it the wrong way? Don't put a limit. Don't put a limit on forgiveness, because when you get to that limit, what's on the other side? It's bitterness. That's what's on the other side of it. And you might be sitting there thinking, but what about? And you're filling in the blank in your mind, but what about? Listen, you can fill in the blank with whatever you want, we're not talking about trust. When trust is broken, yeah, it takes time to rebuild. Absolutely. We're not advocating ignoring sin. In fact, Jesus literally just talked about dealing with sin, doing it the right way, but you got to deal with sin. So whatever the but what about you want to bring into this conversation Getting rid of anger, seeking reconciliation is the inescapable expectation of God. It is repeated over and over and over throughout the Word of God. 
Now, I understand unlimited forgiveness sounds hard. In fact, it may even sound unreasonable. So Jesus tells another parable to teach us how to do it. How do we live a life of unlimited forgiveness? How do we do that? Well, let's read the story that Jesus told. Verse 23, uh, 21, Peter says, how many times to forgive? Jesus gives him the answer. And then verse 23, therefore, the kingdom of heaven can be compared to a king who decided to bring his accounts up to date with servants who had borrowed money from him. In the process, one of his debtors was brought in who owed him millions of dollars. Now, we'll come back and look at the original language in just a moment, but just in your mind, just a lot of money, right? He owes him a lot of money, and he couldn't pay it. So his master ordered that he be sold, and <laughs> along with his wife and his children, everything he owed, because you're going to have to be a slave, you're going to lose everything to pay the debt. But the man fell down before his master, before the king, and he begged him, please be patient with me. I will pay it all. Pause. There is no way this guy could ever repay what he owed. Couldn't do it. So there's, a, there's some pride happening here in this guy. Like he actually, he's trying to convince the king that he can do something that everybody in the room knows he, he'll never be able to do. His master, though, was filled with pity for him. He released him and forgave his debt. He canceled his debt. But when the man left the king, he went to a fellow servant who owed him $1,000. We'll talk about the actual money value in today's dollars in just a moment. So this guy owes him some money, and he grabbed him by the throat demanded instant payment. Pay me what you owe me now. And his fellow servant fell down before him. Same thing. Begged him for a little more time. Be patient with me. I'll pay it. I'll pay it. He pleaded with him. But his creditor would not wait. He had the man arrested, put in prison until the debt could be paid in full. Wow, that doesn't seem right. Verse 31. When some of the other servants saw this, they were upset, rightly so. We're all kind of irritated this guy now too, aren't we? They went to the king. They told him everything that had happened. The king called in the man that he had forgiven and said, You evil servant, I forgave you that tremendous debt because you pleaded with me. Shouldn't you have mercy on your fellow servant just as I had mercy on you? Then the angry king sent the man to prison to be tortured until he had paid his entire debt. And that's what my heavenly father will do to you if you refuse to forgive your brothers and sisters from your heart. Wow. It's an incredible story. I don't want you to miss out, though, on the beauty and the power of this parable by missing the, the modern picture that these debts actually represent in today's dollars. When Jesus told the story in the original language, in the original time period, the amounts, and depending on the version that you have in your lap, you might have these terms, denarii and talents. Denarii and talents. That's how, that's how money was measured. And obviously dollars didn't exist. So let's, let's see if we can have a current, a current equivalent to, because you know, your dollar doesn't, is not worth what it was five years ago, right? So you understand that dollars, even dollars, don't, don't always stay the same in value. So let's see if we can get a, an actual current value. A denarii represented a day's wage. What, a, a, on average, a, a person could make in a day. According to the people who track this stuff, uh, I think it was um, one of those websites, that ZipRecruiter or something like that, they track this kind of stuff. And according to them, in 2022, currently, an average day wage they track it back from the salary of 34000 Now, depending on where you live in the country, but on average across the country, it's about $34,000 a year for a day wage type of job. And you break that down, and yes, I used a calculator. I can't do math in my head. $2,833 a month, $654 a week. 
Here's the bottom line, 93 bucks a day. So on average, $93 a day, and I, I, I think I used Pennsylvania's uh, as opposed to some other states. So 93 bucks a day. That's a denarii, $93 a day. A talent was equivalent to 6,000 denarii. So you take 6,000 times 93, uh, and, and the amount that uh, we're talking about for a, for a talent, or a, yeah, a talent would be $558,000, $558,000. That's a talent. So denarii, 93 bucks, a talent, 558,000. Yay math, right? We love math. So somehow, and it, I don't, it's not expanded in the story and how this debt was incurred. It says borrowed. Uh, he could have embezzled it. He could have uh, cooked the book. We don't know how he incurred that much debt without anyone noticing. That's not really the point. He has this incredible debt, and this, Jesus says 10,000 talents. 10,000 talents. That is $5.58 billion. That is an amount. $5.5 billion is an amount that he could never pay back. And that's the way it is with our sin. We owe God a sin debt that we can never pay back on our own. It's not possible. Without the grace of God stepping in, without Jesus stepping in and paying off our sin debt with his own sinless life, we are without hope. Now, when the king says he canceled the debt, you need to understand that the king is the one who took the financial hit for that. The king is the one who made the sacrifice. I'm sure you've heard this debate going on right now about student loan forgiveness, right? I'm sure you've heard about it. And uh, those who understand economics, those who understand how debt actually works, they're asking the question, why? Why should I have to pay off somebody else's student loan debt? And, and maybe you come to a completely different answer on the why question, and that's fine. But that's canceling debt as if it's just taking a, a marker and going, and it just evaporates into air. That's not how debt works. To cancel or forgive debt means someone else pays it. Someone else takes the hit for that. Someone else makes the sacrifice for that debt. Debt doesn't just evaporate into thin air. Our sin debt was not just erased and forgotten about. Jesus had to pay it. Jesus paid our sin debt in full. He took the penalty for our sin. And back to our story, this king took the financial hit of $5.5 billion. That's significant. The guy who was forgiven the debt of $5.5 billion then, if you can just, it's hard to even fathom that, but then he goes and he confronts someone that owes him 100 denarii. Again, you can get your calculator out. 100 denarii is $9,300. And he demanded payment, had the guy thrown in prison, right? Now, is $9,300 a significant amount of money? I think most of us in the room said, yeah, that's a lot of money. To most of us, if, if someone owed me, if someone owed you $9,300, and they're like, I can't pay you back, most of us will be like, well, that's not okay. That's a big deal. Figure it out. When someone, when someone treats you poorly, when someone hurts you, they incur a significant debt with you. In your mind, in your heart, you're like, what you did, what you said, it really hurt me. I'm not going to pretend that it was not a big deal because it was. You really wounded me. You owe me a $9,300 apology. You need to make this right. 
I think these amounts that Jesus uses just make this incredibly profound point about forgiveness because Jesus is not saying that the $9,300 is so small, so insignificant that it doesn't matter. It just, just forget about it. Jesus is saying, yeah, the $9,300 debt that someone owes you, yeah, it's a big deal. But I want you to compare it to the $5.5 billion that God has forgiven you. Compare the debt that you are owed to the debt that Jesus paid for and canceled on our behalf. Does nine grand matter? Yeah, it matters. But compared to $5.5 billion, See, if all we do is focus on the $9,300 that someone owes us, yeah, it's going to be really hard to forgive. It will be if that's all we're focused on. But if we can remember how much we've been forgiven by God, if we can drop our pride long enough to remember that we have been forgiven a debt that was impossible for us to repay, well, then our hearts will soften. And we will be able to live a life of unlimited forgiveness. I think this is where preaching the gospel to ourselves on a daily basis makes such a difference in our lives. See, when, when we remind ourselves of the $5.5 billion that God has erased from our sin account, when we remind ourselves that Jesus paid the penalty, it wasn't like they, that, that God just went, eh, it doesn't matter. It's not what happened. Jesus suffered and died to pay that debt. When we remember that we can only accept God's gift of grace through faith in Jesus, we don't earn it, we don't deserve it. When we remember that when we trust Christ as our Savior, that the full measure of the righteousness of Jesus is credited to our bankrupt account, and that when God sees us, He sees the righteousness of Jesus when you think about all of those things, you preach the gospel to yourself every day, how can that not change the way you walk through the day? How can that not impact the way that you, uh, the, the relationships that you have with other people, even when they fail and when they, they fall short and they disappoint us and when they hurt us? I started this series by asking the question, do you want to make a point or do you want to make a difference? So I want to finish the series with a, with a story about forgiveness, about how canceling the debt can make an incredible, a huge difference in the lives of other people. Back in February of 2015, a little while back, there was a group of ISIS soldiers who had captured 21 young Christian Egyptians in Libya. They captured them, and they took them to a beach in Libya. They took them to a beach, forced them all to get on their knees, and they made this video, and in the video, they said something along the lines of, this is what happens to people of the cross. I think that's how they describe them, people of the cross. They're not worth living. And they executed every one of them, put it on YouTube. And the point that they were trying to make is this is what will happen to any other person of the cross who, who uh, won't renounce their faith in Jesus. This is, this is what will happen to you. Right? They were trying to scare people, trying to intimidate Christians. Well, as it turned out, the opposite actually happened. These, these were Egyptian citizens, and so in Egypt, they have you know, television like, like we do, and the biggest talk show in Egypt had one of, the, one of these guys that was shot and killed, his mom, on the talk show to interview her. And in the interview, the, the question that you would expect was asked, if you had 
If you had those who murdered your son and these other young men, if you had them here right now, what would you say to them? What punishment would be enough to satisfy what they did to your son and to these others? And there's probably an answer that most of us, most of Egypt expected. Here's what she said. She said, you know, I only wish for all these men to find forgiveness in Jesus Christ. I only wish for these men who took the lives of my son and the 20 other Christian young men, that they would know the love of Jesus Christ, that they would find true life and true forgiveness through faith in him. That's my one desire. As you can imagine, those words spread throughout Egypt, creating kind of like a shock and awe. Egypt is primarily a Muslim nation. But people began to ask the question, what faith is so strong to forgive such a horrible crime? Tens of thousands of people came to know Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. The door was opened to the gospel in a place where the gospel is not readily uh, proclaimed because a woman chose to live out the gospel, because a woman chose to cancel the debt of others, as great as that debt was. She was more focused on the debt that Jesus canceled in her life, the debt that Jesus canceled in her son's life, than the debt that she was owed. I'm not saying that that was easy, but you want to talk about making a difference? Do we want to make a point? Or do we want to make a difference? The way of Jesus is going to make a difference.